Hi, hi. <laughs> Um, welcome to uh, the Department of Public Administration's first fall lecture. And we have a treat for you. Hey, I saw many of you last night, didn't I? Yes, I did. Can't hear? Okay. Can you hear now? All right. Um, we're happy to see so many students and guests. And um, it really helps to broaden our perspective as students and public administrators. To, uh, before we um, begin our talk tonight, I'd like to inter uh, introduce a few people. Um, Dr. Archie, where are you? Yay, he is our chief diversity officer and uh, a fan of the MPA program, he said. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, Want to make sure, and, uh, Anybody else from at Brockport? All right, we have all of our faculty here. Um, and let's see, huh? Right, right. Um, our faculty, uh, Dr. or uh, Mr. Steve Hamner, who will be here in a minute. Um, Dr. Shin No, Dr. Viva K. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Celia Watt, and anybody else? And also we have a guest from REOC, um, John. And uh, let's see, Back, uh, the staff, Stephen, and we've got a couple of GAs, um, Pat, and I guess that's it. <gasps> There we go, Katie, yes. <laughs> um, and uh, also we've got a couple of alums. Would you like to raise your hand? I thought we had Latino is coming. No other? There are pretty, there are a few of you that are close to alums, right? A couple of you, <laughs> okay. Um, tonight, uh, and tonight what I'd like to do is I'm going to turn this over to uh, Mr. Steve Hamner because he is the director, the new director of the Poverty Studies Emphasis, and he is also the director of IPSET, and he'll tell you a little, a little bit about that tonight, um, but he certainly knows our speaker well. Um, so without any further ado, oh, we do have a couple of other things. We have an open house here on October 17th. Our second speaker series is gonna be November 19th. And we're also, some of you have gotten invitations to join Pi Alpha Alpha, and I would encourage you to do that. Um, so without any further ado, let me let you take over. Thank you. And I actually won't say uh, too much about it said because I wanna get us to our speaker tonight other than to say what it stands for, which is the Institute for Poverty Studies and Economic Development. Um, my privilege tonight is to introduce tonight's speaker because as I was kind of reflecting on this opportunity to have this conversation, especially as students, but really for society, it's important for us to understand history and where we came from and where people are coming from so that we can relate to each other but it's also central to shaping how we view ourselves as a region and our collective vision for what we want to become, especially in this region, which is largely segregated, even in ways that don't exist in other cities around the country. And so uh, tonight's topic is one that we have to tackle and we have to tackle openly. And so I'm excited as the director of the Institute, as we partner with the Community Foundation, uh, and they support us, uh, which we appreciate greatly. Uh, so let me tell you about our speaker. Uh, he is Simeon Bannister, and he's the Vice President of Community Programs at the Rochester Area Community Foundation. He's responsible for managing the Community Programs Department, which does the Foundation's grant making and community leadership. Uh, he's a former member of the Rush Henrietta Board of Education, he serves on a number of bodies, particularly as the president of the Greater Rochester Martin Luther King Jr. Commission and several boards, the Congressional Award Foundation, the Hillside Children's Foundation, Children's Agenda, and the Genesee Land Trust. So uh, 
I am excited to hear uh, from somebody who is a proven leader. Uh, he is a walking systems disruptor. He is somebody who I've seen speak passionately about breaking the cycle of poverty. Uh, and I just admire him greatly. So I know you'll enjoy this. It's going to spark lots of questions, get them together, ask them. This is a great opportunity to learn. Uh, so I encourage you uh, to get ready for a great talk. Simeon, the floor is all yours. What a pleasure to uh, be here with you uh, tonight. Um, I'm feeling pretty uh, excited, uh, not the least uh, reason because of being in this room, but also because this is normally the time I go to the gym. So y'all are about to get a workout tonight. Uh, but all jokes aside, uh, it really is a, a pleasure to be here. I just want to start really quickly by asking, um, how many folks in the room are from Rochester? All right, so this is home territory here. Um, and then just so I can see the uh, alternate, how many folks are not from Rochester? All right, and for those of the folks that, have, uh, that are not from Rochester, you've been in the community, just shout it out, generally how long, a year, two years, three years, five years, 10 years? Years. 30 years, 20, okay. <laughs> All right, see so y'all from here, that's, you know. Um, okay, so the reason why I asked it is that what we wanna do uh, tonight is explore a little bit of the history of this community. Uh, Steve got it right that uh, in many ways, particularly for folks that intend to be practitioners of the administration of the public, um, that we have a problem in this community uh, where uh, folks are a bit ignorant about the history of Rochester. Um, and to be a good administrator, seems to me that you wanna know about the place that you're going to administer. And so we wanna explore that a little bit. This symbol that's uh, on the screen uh, is, uh, no, is anybody familiar with that? Sankofa, that's right. Uh, we look to the past for a brighter future. We go back and uh, take the things that are the most helpful to us and we catapult them forward so that we set the stage for uh, how we move forward. So that's what we want to do tonight. We want to look at the history of this community and think about the implications that it has for uh, this community as we begin to move forward into the future. Is that all right? Yeah. All right. They told me I have a clicker here that I'm surely going to mess up, but I'll do my best. <laughs> All right, so we start with a couple of assumptions. Um, the first uh, assumption that I have is that, generally speaking, most audiences that I get in front of, people think that racism is bad. Uh, is there anybody in the room that would like to defend racism? Want to give you a chance? You know, every now and again, you never know. All right, so assuming that uh, we all agree that racism is not a good thing, so that's number one. Um, number two, um, I'm going to assume that most people here uh, have an understanding of the experience of interpersonal racism. Does anybody know what I mean by interpersonal racism? Anybody? This is participatory, by the way. I, I should have said that at the outset. Go ahead. Precisely, precisely. The stuff that we typically hear about, the name calling, right? Somebody said the stuff that you get castigated for in public. Uh, the guy that was at the, the news uh, station uh, that made the, the verbal uh, slip, as he, as he described it, right? That kind of interpersonal dynamic is the stuff that we generally think of uh, when we talk about, um, when we talk about uh, racism. Um, but I want to propose to you that we likely have different perspectives uh, when we move beyond the interpersonal level, when we think about racism. So if you'll indulge me for just a second, I want you to just quickly turn to your neighbor, um, and I want you to tell your neighbor something that you have done recently um, to um, uh, deal with racism and say in this community, anything that you've done, just quickly to your neighbor, anything that you've done to reduce racism, to first maybe introduce each other to one another, to reduce racism, <laughs> to reduce racism. fight against racism. <laughs> Anybody care to share something that they've done about racism? Something they've done to reduce racism? Anybody? Um, my husband and I talk openly about our internal feelings that might be considered racist. Thank you. We talk a little bit about internally about racism and racist feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody else want to? Something that you've done recently to try to reduce fight against racism, reduce racism. We all agree that racism is bad. Anything that you've done to try to reduce it? Anybody else want to share? 
Let's see the floor. Yes. Yep. So kind of a dialogue about the history. She says the dialogue, I want to make sure, you, and correct me if I got this wrong, um, there was a set of circumstances that existed in the 60, in the 50s and 60s, and we're having some open dialogue about what happened then and what that means for today. Is that fair to say? Okay. Uh, and so generally speaking, even in the solutions that we offer, we often tend to rest on the interpersonal, the dynamic that happens in between people right? The conversations that happen, the dialogues that we want to create. And what I would submit to you is that racism actually operates uh, on a couple of different levels. It's a continuum of, 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 uh, of, uh, of, of racism, if you will. Uh, and so as I present these categories, please note that they interplay, uh, that there's interplay between them. And so we have everything from internal racism, right? Some of the, what you described as these internal feelings that we need to continue to wrestle with. And in some cases, it's internalized inferiority. In other cases, it's internalized supremacy, right? But that internal racism, we've got interpersonal, as I described, where we've got folks that are saying things to each other and that kind of, you know, the, the dynamics that happen between uh, people. Uh, we've got institutional racism, right? Where we've got organizations and institutions that need to think through uh, the ways that race continues to show up in those organizations. And finally, we have structural racism. And what we want to talk about tonight is structural racism. That's what I want to rest on uh, with you this evening. This very long definition is the result of work of a community uh, collaborative uh, known as the Racial Equity and Justice Initiative that started here in Rochester just a few months ago. Uh, it's one of the things that at the Community Foundation I was very proud to fund. Um, because we need to start having these kinds of conversations. What they offer here is a definition. I'll give you a moment to read it, but I really just want to point out the underlying uh, and, the, uh, and the red highlights. Uh, so structural racism, we want to talk about public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations, uh, characteristics that we want to talk about. It's cumulative, adverse outcomes. Uh, it's about systems, all right? So as you think about structural racism, I'm gonna ask you for a moment, let's take the, the uh, interpersonal, we're gonna set that aside for tonight. We know that it's important, we know that it's critical, but in this country, we spend a lot of time on the interpersonal, right? We spend a lot of time talking about who said what. And what we wanna talk about tonight are the structural stuff that's gonna be a little bit more difficult to see. So on what levels uh, does uh, racism operate? Well, we got public policies. That's what a lot of folks in this room need to be cognizant of, right? As you prepare to become public administrators, um, and those uh, are the things that we kind of know of laws, uh, the allocation of resources, the distribution of resources. Uh, we've got institutional practices, the norms, uh, things like who gets hired and who doesn't get hired, uh, who has to, how you can wear your hair at work, uh, and so on and so forth. We've got cultural representations and these other norms that are really critical for us to understand. Uh, as an example, when you turn on the news or open the newspaper, uh, there's a show on uh, Netflix right now that I rather enjoy uh, called Top Boy. Anybody seen Top Boy on Netflix? Uh, it's about some British dudes that are involved in the uh, uh, illegal narcotics trade. They ply their trade in illegal narcotics. But I never see the Top Boy as like the top black business dude movie. Like, where's that movie, right? So these cultural representations become really, really important for us to be cognizant of. And when we talk about the characteristics of structural racism, I want you to keep these terms in your mind because uh, they're going to show themselves up in a, in a few minutes. Uh, so keep these terms in your mind. The characteristics of structural racism. Number one, structural racism is cumulative. This is really important to understand, that it accumulates generation after generation after generation. So you have some folks that will say about racism, well, gee, that happened. Slavery was hundreds of years ago. Why can't people get over it, right? Racism, in many ways, is death by a thousand cuts that happens generation after generation, and it accrues, uh, the, the ill effects of racism accrue across generations. And we're going to see some examples of how that happens. Uh, racism is about adverse outcomes, right? I was in a meeting with some of my colleagues um, with the Structural Racism Initiative here in Rochester, 
And one of my colleagues said, Simeon, you know, a, a white colleague of mine said, Simeon, I'm so, you know, I, I really, I'm trying to understand this, whatever. The thing I just know is I don't like being called racist because I'm a good person. You know, I'm a good person, right? I'm not a, I'm not a racist because I'm a good person. But what we have to understand is that particularly when we talk about structural racism, structural racism is about adverse outcomes for people of, uh, of, of color, not about intent. Like you can mean to do good things and still have really bad things result that get visited upon people of color, right? So that's a very important distinction and one that a lot of people miss because it doesn't mean that you're a bad person and a, you can be a, a, a good person in the way that we typically think of good people and still be a racist. This is not something that, uh, there's like a bit of cognitive dissonance for a lot of people when they try to conceptualize what this means because racism is because such a, has become such a loaded term in our communities and in our society, all right? But I want you to keep these in mind. Again, it's about outcomes, not intent. It's systemic. Uh, so it's interdependent, it's interacting. It's the healthcare system and the interplay that it has with the criminal justice system and the interplay that it has with the education system and the interplay that it has with the employment system and the interplay that it has, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? That these systems, in some senses, feed on each other, and that when you add that characteristic of being multi generational, systemic, we have a real set of challenges that we have to confront. And then finally, and I think in many ways, one of the most misunderstood characteristics of racism is that it's retrenching, of structural racism is that it's retrenching. So, what do we mean by retrenching? Well, we have this kind of uh, myth that we've been bequeathed in our community, in our society that uh, we are in this linear path. Even Dr. King said that the moral arc of, just, uh, of the universe bends towards justice. And so we have a linear conception of racism, right? That either we are marching forward and it's getting better or we're marching uh, backwards and it's getting worse. That Obama came and we marched forward and then, well, maybe the guy that's there now, we marched back, <laughs> right? Okay, and so there's a, but it's entirely possible that you can have, and in fact it happened, the first black president and a repressive immigration system. Those two things can happen at the same time. Not only that, but racism has this very sneaky way, right, of being able to reassert itself. Just when you think that you've made progress, it, uh, you get what, what's, what we often call the racial backlash, right? Uh, and so it can be retrenching and it moves in a couple of different, uh, in, in, a, in, in a multifaceted way. So again, I want you to just take these terms, just stick them in your back pocket. All right, so let's talk about Rochester and this community. So Rochester, everybody know the history of Rochester. This was a, a Western Front boom town. Uh, if you ever get the chance, uh, particularly for those that are uh, living temporarily in our fair city, I would encourage you to check out the Rochester Historical Society. Uh, one of the things that they have there are portraits of the initial um, founders of, uh, of, of the city of Rochester. And one of the things that's fascinating about those photos uh, is that most of those people did not die in Rochester. This was a way station. People were came here and then kept on pushing out west. Uh, most of their children did not stay in Rochester. Nathaniel Rochester's children did not stay in Rochester and ended up moving out west. So this was a point of departure place. This was kind of the place that you got supplies and all that kind of stuff, particularly uh, in, the, uh, in the 19th century. Uh, but towards the end of the 19th century, we had rapid population growth. <laughs> Right, I mean, this place grew like gangbusters. Uh, and so in 1850, the population of Rochester was uh, 36,000. By 1950 years, uh, it was 162,000, right? We were the flower city, F-L-O-U-R. The flour mills were really the driving economic force um, in Rochester. And so by the, uh, uh, the uh, mid uh, 20th century, the early to mid 20th century, is when you start to see massive economic expansion in Rochester. Kodak, Xerox, Bausch, right? These companies really find their footing in this town uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the early, two th in the, um, uh, early 20th century. Uh, and as they start to grow, what we see is rapid capital creation in Rochester. Buildings get built, businesses get started all kinds of new opportunities are created. We actually see the literal creation of capital in Rochester that happens in this period, 1910 to 1950. And 1950 really represents the zenith in Rochester. In many ways, Rochester was Silicon Valley before Silicon Valley. I saw a statistic that in the mid fifties in Rochester, on almost 60% of manufacturing jobs were instrument-based manufacturing. What do we mean by that? Dials and knobs. So this wasn't the kind of place that you go from field to factory floor. 
right? This wasn't Pittsburgh, where you go work in a steel mill and swing a hammer, uh, or even uh, the, the, uh, the, the manufacturing auto lines up in Detroit, right? Rochester was different in that way. Rochester, again, would be akin to if you just walked into Mountain View right now and said, hey, I'm looking for a job. And they'd say, well, can you code? I mean, can you, like, do you have any special skills to be here? Well, if not, maybe we got a standard job for, I don't know, you know, but you can't be here because that's not the kind of jobs that we have here. Does anybody know who this is? It was said, anybody else? So this is Austin Stewart. And Austin Stewart is credited uh, with being the first uh, black man in uh, Rochester. Uh, I've written, for that matter, the first person of color uh, in Rochester. So Austin Stewart uh, came here around 1800, 1801, and uh, settled in what is now known as Clarissa Street. Does everybody know where Clarissa Street is? So he settled on what's now known as Clarissa Street. Um, before it was Clarissa Street, it was Caledonia uh, Avenue. Uh, and when he settled there, he actually opened a, a grocer. He was a grocer and a butcher and operated a fairly successful business um, in, that, uh, in that section of, uh, of town. Uh, and then we started to see the population uh, uh, start to grow. Now, is anybody familiar with the Great Migration? We all know conceptually with the Great Migration. Anybody want to just raise your hand really quick. The Great Migration, we know what it is. Anybody want to just say what it is? That's exactly it. Uh, and, uh, and it's important to note that as the national economy was shifting from an agrarian-based economy to a more industrialized economy, not only did people voluntarily get up and leave in the South and come to the North, it was also the case that Southern, that Northern companies went down South and recruited people to come North, right? Uh, because we needed to fill all these factories that were getting built all across the country, right? So that's the Great Migration. It's a period that's usually acknowledged to be yeah, 1920 to 1970 is generally the, the period. Uh, so anybody want to take a gander? So if I, you know, with, with that information, anybody want to take a gander at what Rochester's uh, non-white population was in 1950? Just a percentage. Just shout it out. What do you got? 45%. Anybody else? And I'll give you a little hint that today the population is about 62% non-white in the city of Rochester. Anybody else? Just throw a number out. 45%, so we've got two 45s. Anybody else want to? Oh, 25%, I'm sorry. 25%, 45%, anybody else? 30%, all right? So we got 25%, we got 30%, we got 45%. Census in 1950, Rochester's non-white population was less than 2%. Wow. And oh, by the way, that is when the city of Rochester had its highest population ever. 1950, the population of Rochester was 332,000, shade over 332,000. So, at what period of time was the abolition, uh, the abolition movement? All right, so abolition movement would have been in the late uh, 19th century. So that's when we see Frederick Douglass and, and others. The Rochester, the African-American community in Rochester was infinitesimal at that point, and frankly, infinitesimal at this point. And so, despite, so Frederick Douglass, certainly a key figure in this town, um, a para, but sometimes the shadow of Frederick Douglass gets past longer when we think about the overall population. So one would be led to believe that there was a fairly large black community here. There had to be, right? It's Frederick Douglass was here. But actually, that wasn't, that wasn't the case. So in 1950, again, less than 2%, about 7,800 um, uh, non-white people um, with the vast majority of, of those, about 90-ish, over 90% being, uh, actually about 96%, 97% being uh, African American or Black, uh, at least as defined by the census, okay? So that's 1950. Census in 1960, what happens? Well, number one, does this have the laser thing? Yep, okay, so number one, population goes down by 1960. So we're from 332,000, now we're down to 318,000. So the population is declining now in Rochester, 1950 zenith, now we start the downturn, all right? And then it's non-white population, uh, at that point was, uh, I can tell you, I can't see them on here, but it was 24,000. Okay, so we have declining overall population, you have now inclining non-white population, 1970. 
1970, overall population continues its decline. Overall population, 296,000 in 1970, <coughs> non-white population, 52,115. Significant growth, 1950, 1960, 1970. Keep that in the back of your mind. So the trend is clear, right? And that trend has essentially continued to today, where we've had population decline in the city of Rochester. You had a, a significant decline of the white population in the city of Rochester. And you've had uh, growth, fairly significant growth, of the non-white population in the city of Rochester, right? And look at the period from 1950 uh, to now. So in 1950, you have basically very few, none, almost none, uh, uh, African American folks, or or anyone else, frankly, uh, in this town. Hey, listen, something else to keep in mind when we look at these numbers. We're going to talk a little bit about why that number happened too. So we we kind of explore a little bit why we saw some of the increase, but we're going to talk a little bit about why we saw that decline uh, as well. But here's what's important to note. So in Rochester. If we acknowledge this history, 1910 to 1950, what happened? Capital creation, economic expansion, growth. During that period, the non-white population in this town was either absent on the periphery or excluded. And I want you to think about the implications of that. Absent literally wasn't here on the periphery, to the extent that there were people of color in mass in this area, most folks were actually in places like Mumford, and places like Sotus, and Newark, on the outskirts of town, because when people were coming to this region, most folks were coming as field hands from the South. So my parents actually met, who they both lived in Sierra Rochester, actually met at a party in Sotus in 1964. That's where my parents met at a party in Sona, not in a dance in Rochester, <laughs> right? Because that's where a lot of the community was. And I remember as a kid growing up, my dad would take us, we would go down to um, First Calvary down in Mumford. And I was like, why are we driving all the way out here, right? Uh, I used to do some work uh, some years back as a commercial real estate appraiser. I remember going to appraise a property out in Newark and being like, wow, there's sure are a lot of people of color in Newark. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so you get folks that were on the periphery. They were absent in the city of Rochester, and to the extent that there were people in the city, they were generally excluded from participation in the economic vitality of the city. We all know that Kodak was not hiring people of color. Those are just the facts. In fact, um, uh, our CEO, her assistant, uh, uh, Norma uh, Gallery is wonderful, was a C-suite executive at Kodak. She's uh, now known as 83, 84 years old. Um, but she was a C-suite executive at Kodak. And when I did this presentation for my colleagues at work, she said to me, Sivian, I remember being at Kodak. I remember the conversations that, that, that vice president and the president was having that were exclusionary. I remember when Franklin Florence came in. Everybody know that is Franklin Florence? You know that story, Franklin Florence? And others worked with Saul Alinsky to organize folks in this community to try to fight. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, but uh, when they did, um, they went to Kodak, a board meeting in New Jersey, very seminal moment in this community. They show up at a board meeting in New Jersey and shut the board meeting down until they can get concessions for Kodak to start hiring people of color in this community, right? Um, she said, I remember when that happened. And I remember that the vice president that made the agreement with uh, Franklin Florence promptly came back to the office and was demoted. So I remember that clearly. And she said, the only reason why he didn't get fired is because people like him. He's a popular guy. So what we have then is that the rapid growth in, community, in, uh, in the community in Rochester, particularly the economic expansion of Rochester, um, it was not, um, uh, so that happens before people get here. And then when they do get here, right, that growth is not concomitant. It doesn't happen at the same time uh, with the growth of equivalent growth of resources. So when the communities of color finally do arrive in Rochester, when they finally get here, because remember, there were no jobs here, there were no opportunities here in meaningful ways for people of color. When they do get here, we're locked out of economic systems that are in play. So much water has gone under the bridge, and so that by the time people get here, the party's already over. The steep decline is already underway. 
We know about it in the 80s and 90s is when we really feel it, right? But the seeds had already been sown for Kodak and Xeroxes and so on and so forth. That decline had already started. My dad worked for Xerox. When he worked for Xerox as a kid growing up, I never thought about going to work for Xerox because it was a dying company by the time I came along. So it's a one generation. My dad could never make the call to get his son the cushy gig, <laughs> right? Couldn't happen. My grandfather, my family actually, and I didn't learn this until I started doing this research, uh, was one of the first African-American families here in Rochester. My, my family came here in 1927. My grandfather, that was a, a grand uncle, my grandfather came here in 1946, came here to work construction. Now, I love the job that I have, I love being able to come out and talk to rooms like this, but I think I would have equally and perhaps even more loved being the scion of the Bannister construction family. But that never happened. Let's talk about why. Let's see here. That must, I think we got slides and got a little bit out of, out of um, sequence. So let's talk a little bit about um, these uh, four items, um, and I just wanted to share, you know, again, a, a quick narrative. So the book to the left is called The Color of Law. Um, it's a book that I absolutely recommend for everybody in this room. The author actually was recently in Rochester this summer, um, and it chronicles the ingenious ways that our country has engaged in what's known as du jour segregation, as opposed to de facto segregation. De facto segregation assumes that, hey, people just kind of like, you know, tend to go to their own corners, just what people do, you know? Uh, and that uh, all things being equal, you know, that's, that would have happened. The segregation that we see in this society would have happened regardless. Um, what Richard makes a very compelling argument is that what we actually have is de jure segregation, that policies created this set of circumstances. Uh, we've got RIT uh, in the corner. Now, RIT, we all know is where? Located where? Henrietta. Henrietta. That's where we know her, Henrietta. RIT actually used to be, it started out as the Mechanics Institute, uh, and its headquarters was right next to where the present-day Rochester City School District is. Uh, the Bevier Building was part of RIT's campus. All through Cornhill, all those mansions were part of RIT's campus. And the reason why was because the way that RIT grew is that they acquired lyceums and other educational institutions, and then they would buy some of the old Ruffled Shirt District mansions so that they had the space to actually offer classes. Uh, in the middle there is, uh, is um, a story about the Pithod feeling, and, and what that reference is is an old jazz club that was called the Pithod Room, and that was on Clarissa Street. Uh, and the Pithod Room was like, I mean, everybody that you can think of came to the Pithod Room. All the major jazz, so it would be the equivalent of like, you know, Beyonce and like, you know, whatever come in, like, right? I mean, so like everybody came to the Pithod Room. Big club, a, a small uh, facility, but a big club um, here in, uh, in Rochester. Uh, with a lot of history. And then finally, um, the, uh, uh, there's a map, a picture rather of the, uh, the battery's dying, picture of the inner loop, all right? So what Richard Rothstein says in his book, and uh, I'm gonna give a little bit of uh, spoiler alert, uh, but I hope that you still go and read it because this is the sum total, uh, is that in 1938, the Vice President of the United States of America, again, please keep your public administration hats on, right? This is policy stuff, the Vice President uh, of the United States of America, um, a guy named Harry Wallace, uh, was Roosevelt's vice president, came out of you know, uh, New York City, was a guy that was really kind of known as um, uh, like a real like liberal icon, right? That's what he's come to be known as, certainly in, in, this, in this day and age, uh, kind of a liberal icon. Um, a lot of people, he was for socialized medicine, a lot of people said that if he was the successor to uh, Roosevelt, that the country would look completely different, that he would have completed um, the New Deal uh, efforts and, and, that, and that this country would look a lot different. Um, and he was, of course, manu outmaneuvered and outflanked by uh, Harry uh, Truman. Uh, that guy uh, came up with a policy uh, that was, a, a na a, frankly, a nasty little euphemism that said that we could use inner ring roadways for slum clearing, that we could remove the unsightly and unsanitary and blighted conditions of urban centers with these new roadways. And of course, that was a euphemism for communities of color, right? So that guy, the liberal icon guy, like that guy comes up with this policy and it becomes essentially the uh, stated policy of the Federal Highway Department in 1950. And the inner loop starts construction in 1951. 
and the inner loop starts construction, actually, uh, so the current inner loop uh, is not where the original inner loop was. So it's actually where Plymouth Avenue runs, was the original inner loop. It started over by City Hall, ran down uh, in front of the school district. That was the original inner loop. And it cut right through the middle of RIT's campus. So RIT promptly said, well, gee, we don't want to be here. So they said, you know, by 1953, they started making plans and they were out the door by 55 to get out to Henrietta. When they leave, they leave in unscrupulous conditions, in an unscrupulous way, rather. And so what happens to all those old mansions? Unscrupulous landlords acquire them and they start shoving people into these places faster than you can pack them in. Because remember, we saw the population increase that happened in the 50s and 60s and then later into the 70s. So people are being shoved into these tenements. Terrible conditions. Does anybody know what happens here in Rochester in 1964? I like to call it the uprise. 1964. And it's not a shock when you think about the conditions. Again, public policies that were put in play. De jure segregation, layer on top of that, redlining, layer on top of that, all of the various policies that kept people boxed in and from being able to move. Hey, let's get deprivation of resources. There's no grocery store, there's no resources that are in these communities. The economics started to suffer. My father grew up on Troop Street, which was right on the middle of, uh, near the corner of Troop and Clarissa Street. It was the middle of the black community uh, at that time. Black community in Rochester, Doctors, lawyers, there were grocery stores on uh, Clarissa, there was a grocery store rather on Clarissa Street, hotels. I am 37 years old. This year, this summer, and my father grew up there, this summer was the first time that I saw a picture of Clarissa Street in its heyday at the Clarissa Street Festival. So it's a history that's been lost about who is able to generate economic wealth. So we know that the normal pattern for economic uh, growth for communities is that they tend to, our community comes in, sets up small enterprises, builds those enterprises, begins to trade outside of their homogenous group, integrates into homogenous group, and rinse and repeat. But that process was abrogated here. Does everybody follow me? That got halted, stopped dead in its tracks, right? So you get the uprising, which by the way, not only was here, but also on the other part of the city on Joseph Avenue. Um, and quick, really uh, quick story, I guess I have to be really, really quick on this story. Um, uh, but on Joseph Avenue, um, uh, um, when people came to Rochester, the migratory patterns in Rochester, is anybody here, for, particularly for people that are from here, the East Side, West Side beef, particularly in the African American community, like the East Side, West Side beef is like a real, like people get shot behind the east side, west side beat. Like actually shot behind the east side, west side beat. People may get shot tonight behind the east side, west side beat, right? Okay, so a lot of kids, every kid thinks that, you know, like when you're a teenager, you think they used to. So when I was a kid, we, I thought that it started because you had Biggie and you had Tupac and, you know, I actually grew up, funny enough, I grew up on the, my, I laid my head on the east side, but as I said, my dad grew up on the west side, was from the west, so everything we did, I went to church, school, everything I did was on the west side, right? But this is like big stuff. So we thought it was Biggie and Tupac, and that's where it came from, right? The kids today, they think that they started. I was at Edison the other day talking about this. They think they started it. And it's like, nah, <laughs> you didn't. Where it actually comes from is that the migratory patterns for Rochester, people that tended to come from the northern southern states, like Virginia and North Carolina, tended to settle on the west side. And people that came from the deep south, so Mississippi and Louisiana and such, tended to settle on the east side. And the trope is that you hear from folks, even today, from kids today, at the class, I said to the kids, all right, so who in this classroom is from the, the, um, the uh, east side? And a bunch of kids raised their hand. And I said, all right, east side folks, what do y'all think about west side people? Oh, they bougie, they think they better than everybody. Y'all love, y'all know what it is. They got their nose in the air. And without missing a beat, this kid says, who's from the west side, the only kid from the west side in the class, So hold on, hold on, hold on. It's not that we think we better than y'all. It's that y'all East Side people are dirty. <laughs> this is a trope that has been going on for generations. So even in these informal ways, you see how um, history still reveals itself, right? And how that history still plays out. And even for these young people who are ignorant about that history, literally, I mean, not an exaggeration, kids are getting shot behind that, right? So just important stuff for us to consider. Normally, I would show a, um, a, a, a video here 
Um, and I really do want to show up, but there's not enough time. So I'm going to, you guys, the, 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 uh, let me check in with everybody. Let's do it that way. Let me check in with everybody. How are you guys feeling? Or, okay, so I'm not, I'm not going to hold you on that, I promise. All right, so we're going to get this wrapped up here. But let me just show you this video. It does start with a quick note of profanity. I just want to note that. That, of course, is Chris Rock's famous joke about streets named for Martin Luther King Jr., which tend to be in, let's say, distressed areas. And he's not wrong, because if you look at the way housing segregation works in America, you can see how things end up this way. Once you see it, you won't be able to unsee it. Okay, let's look at MLK Boulevard in Baltimore. I want to show you how to see housing segregation in schools, in health, in family wealth, in policing. But first, an explanatory comma. It's the 1930s in the wake of the Great Depression, FDR's president. He wants to bring economic relief to millions of Americans through a collection of federal programs and projects called New Deal. One part of that New Deal was the National Housing Act of 1934 which introduced ideas like the three-year mortgage and low fixed interest rates. So now you have all these lower-income people who can afford homes, but how do you make sure they don't default on their mortgages? Enter the homeowner's loan corporation. The HOLC created residential security maps, and these maps, they're where the term redlining comes from. Green meant best area, best people, aka businessmen. Blue meant good people like white-collar families. Yellow meant a declining area with working class families, and red meant detrimental influences, hazardous, like foreign born people, low class whites, and most significantly, Negroes. Again and again on these HOLC maps, one of the most consistent criteria for redlining neighborhoods is the presence of black and brown people. Let's be clear studies show that people who lived in redlined areas were not necessarily more likely to default on their mortgages, but redlining made it difficult, if not impossible, to buy or refinance. So landlords abandon their properties, city services become unreliable, in most places, crime increases, and property values drop. All of these conditions fester for 30 years as white people flee to the brand new suburbs popping up all over the country. Many of those suburbs institute rules called covenants that explicitly forbid selling homes to black people. And all of this was perfectly legal. Yeah. Now it's 1968, and MLK is assassinated. Good evening. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, pretty hostile of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shot. Dr. King was shot and was killed tonight. In the aftermath, Congress passed the Fair Housing Act of 1968. It's a policy meant to encourage equal housing opportunities regardless of race or religion or national origin, and it offers protections for future homeowners and renters, but it does little to fix the damage already done. Over the next 50 years, the Fair Housing Act is rarely enforced. So you can still see housing segregation and its effects in Baltimore and often along any MLK Boulevard in any U.S. city, like its effects on wealth. So home ownership is the major way Americans create wealth, right? Well, discrimination in housing is the major reason that black families, up and down the income scale, have a tiny fraction of the family wealth that white families do, even white families with less education and lower incomes. For almost 30 years, 98% of FHA loans were handed out to white borrowers. Not only were black neighborhoods redlined, and not only was the Fair Housing Act selectively enforced, if at all, but it is still today much harder for a black person to get a mortgage or home loan than it is for a white person. Families are fearful of speaking up about a basic human right that should be afforded to everyone in the world, but definitely in the richest country in the world. And housing segregation in schools. The primary way that Americans pay for public schools is by paying property taxes. People who live in more valuable homes have better funded local schools, better paid teachers, better school facilities, and more resources. Here's a feedback loop. The better the schools in a neighborhood, the more those homes in that neighborhood are worth. And the higher the property values of those homes, the more money there is for schools, and so on and so on. And housing segregation in health. Because of urban planning that benefited 
in those richer, wider neighborhoods, people of color are more likely to live near industrial plants that spew toxic fumes. They're more likely to live far away from grocery stores with fresh food and in places where the water isn't drinkable. They're more likely to live in neighborhoods with crumbling infrastructure and in homes with toxic pain. When you're living with rats, roaches, and things like that, that's the problem. You cannot have that kind of stuff with children running around in the building, a building that maybe for a leg. And not coincidentally, people of color have higher incidences of certain cancers, asthma, and heart disease. And housing segregation in policing. Housing segregation means we are having vastly different experiences with crime and vastly different experiences with policing. Because our neighborhoods are so segregated, sometimes racial profiling can be camouflaged as spatial profiling, where living in certain areas can make you more likely to be stopped by the police. And it means that people have a lot of unnecessary contact with the criminal justice system just because of where they live. The problem in our city, the police and the citizens are fight. They keep targeting my brothers and sisters who normally have nothing. And that heavy, aggressive kind of policing that you see in Black neighborhoods in particular makes people feel like they can't trust the police. And when people don't trust the police, crimes go unsolved and people have to find other ways to keep themselves safe. But of course, it's not just Baltimore because housing segregation and discrimination fundamentally shape the lives of people in nearly every major American city. It really is in every day. To hear more about how race shapes American life, visit npr.org slash code switch. Rochester, New York. If you know the city of Rochester, we know that that is the area that is now uh, termed the Crescent. And that's the Southwest. And we know that these are the two most economically challenged parts of our city. And that's our history. And we have to own that in this community. So these are the conditions that have created a set of circumstances in Rochester. So when I jump online and I hear people uh, that uh, say, oh, those poor people just need to get a job. That, you know, the real problem is that maybe they're a little lazy, that they need to be more self-sufficient. We'll get to that. It misses the point that these were policies that were made. One thing I neglected to mention, that 64 uprising, first one of its kind in this country. Before 68, before Watts, before Newark, before DC, 1964 here in Rochester. Landmark housing discrimination cases fought here in Rochester. So think again about this cauldron where you have lack of economic opportunity. You have this situation. You have the creation of capital that gets calcified in the hands of a few folks who have held it for a very long time. Why are we shocked that this is one of the poorest places in the country? How are we surprised that childhood poverty is the highest anywhere in the United States of America, right here in the city of Rochester, my hometown? Because when we know what the history is and we're informed by that history, not only does it call us to account, but then it provides us with some new vistas and new ways of thinking about these problems and what our potential solutions might be. I'm gonna skip ahead, normally I'd like to dwell for a moment and just talk a little bit about the Latino part of this growth in this community, uh, because we don't want to uh, get caught in the uh, black-white dyad, right? That there's a much more multicultural um, part of this story that we need to account for. New immigrants coming to this community also make for an interesting part of the narrative. But in the interest of time, I'm gonna just move through this section, if that's okay. Um, and so I would encourage all, particularly as, a, as public um, administration practitioners, uh, to check out our website, at Ro one of our websites at the Community Foundation. Act Rochester is a community indicators initiative um, that's run out of the, uh, out of the Community Foundation. It's just actrochester.org. Um, and you'll find this report called Hard Facts. And what we did is did an overlay of all of this data against race so that you can actually see how um, after st statistic after statistic represents these challenges. But here's the flip side, that those challenges also represent opportunities because if we invest smarter, 
and we drive resources in smarter ways. This is something that we can do something about. You know how I know? Because people broke it. So if people could break it, that means that people can absolutely fix it, right? So check out that report, see some of the data. One of the most important conclusions in that report is about home ownership in this community and the disparity that exists in home ownership in this community. And that's a place that we can definitely dig the shovels in and do something about. Uh, I'm gonna skip past a couple. I'm not gonna skip past this one though because this is just a personal bug in my craw. Uh, a lot of us in the field, uh, we use this language called self-sufficiency. Most, almost every human service agency in this community uses this term, uh, self-sufficiency. And the opposite of self-sufficiency is what? Dependence, right? That you're dependent on us, that you are a burden on us, that we need to manage, that we need to handle, that we need to fix, that we need to move, that we need to hide, and so on and so forth. Self-sufficiency. If we can just get those people to be more self-sufficient, stop being so dependent on the government, then they would be better off, right? The, interesting, there's a, there's a very fascinating historical narrative here too. Um, and what you see is that in 1952, uh, uh, 50, 50, uh, Barry, Gold, Barry Goldwater ran for president. The modern uh, day Republican Party shifted its tactics when they started to lose cases that were dependent on uh, the Supreme Court's decisions, all of a sudden government became this bad thing. You don't find that kind of language um, you know, earlier than that. Um, and all of a sudden government becomes this bad thing, we need to get rid of government, government needs to shrink, government's the problem and all that kind of stuff. As soon as it starts to work on behalf of the dispossessed and the disadvantaged, right? And then fast forward to today, now that people are taking, taking over the Supreme Court, all of a sudden we don't have a problem with government. Spending doesn't seem to be an issue anymore, right? All these, you know, so anyways, I digress. But, uh, <laughs> But this language of self-sufficiency is a very slippery slope, is the point. Um, and so uh, the Strong, just uh, across the street uh, this year, uh, decided they were going to offer lower admission to SNAP residents. And people in this community, the people that we live here with, our neighbors, said things like, why do we just keep giving them free blank, no incentive to get off welfare, it's better to be poor. I'm assuming that John Hannigan is not poor, because if he was, he'd know that it sucks to be poor. Heather Alexander said, I don't believe most people taking advantage of the SNAP system will care, capitalize, care enough to take their kids here. That takes effort, selflessness, and a desire to see their kids enjoy something. People that have a behavior to take advantage of a government program, she goes on to say, don't deserve to have access to these kinds of benefits. I looked up Heather Alexander. I left her picture on here and everything. I wanted her. <laughs> I looked her up. Heather Alexander lives in Fairport. She owns her home from what I can determine from the pictures on her Facebook page. And Heather Alexander, if she does so, I'm assuming takes advantage of the mortgage interest tax deduction. The mortgage interest tax deduction basically says if you own your home, it got complicated a little bit last year with the changes in the SALT, right? Um, but uh, the state and local tax deduction, but basically what it says is that if you own your home, you can take a portion of your mortgage interest and reduce it from your tax liability. If you take every other housing program that's organized around, uh, particularly around urban density and for low-income people, so that's the low-income housing tax credit, the Home Investment Partnership Program, uh, the Community Development Fund, Public Housing Operating Fund, Public Housing Operating Fund, if you take project-based rental assistance, that's called Section 8, if you take tenant-based tenant uh, uh, rental assistance, a sticky Section 8, and you add all of those together, they represent about a third of what we spend on the mortgage interest tax deduction. So you tell me who's dependent on government. So maybe we need to change this language of self-sufficiency and come up with something that's more accurate, like economically insecure. And that's what we've been proposing to folks. Uh, I'll move past this slide. This is basically that a lot of times we get caught up in the sensational stuff. We get caught up in like the interpersonal, like who called somebody the N-word stuff or whatever. And it obscures our own personal responsibility and the small choices that we make that contribute because again, it's about adverse outcomes, not just about intent. So I, I'll, uh, I will uh, rest here and then I'll do one other slide and then we'll, and then we'll wrap. Uh, so this is uh, really about shared prosperity. It's really the future for this community. And it's really what we need to start thinking about as we kind of pivot now to what we can maybe do about some of this stuff. Number one, we have to recognize that our destinies are tied together, that we are inextricably connected. And the thing that's ironic about it, y'all remember Amazon coming here, right? So I was in uh, some of those discussions, they engaged some of the foundation partners to try to kick in so that we could create an attractive, you know, uh, piece to lure them to come to Rochester. And what we were hearing, and I hear this also in uh, Great Rochester Enterprise, 
is an entity that's responsible for business attraction in Rochester. Every time I go to their meetings, they speak in an unintentional euphemism. They say things like, what we really need to focus on is talent acquisition and, and uh, talent creation around. We have a talent pipeline problem in Rochester. Do you know what that is? Because they don't realize it. When you have 30% of the people sitting on the economic sideline because they're not getting an adequate education, and that's largely visited upon people of color, guess what you end up with? A talent pipeline problem, a human capital problem, right? Important things for us to think about. Regional vitality is inextricably connected to equity. What we're seeing all across the country is an organization called Policy Link. The work that they're doing is proving that, as they say, equity is a superior growth model. And I, have a, 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 I will save it for another time. I'll come back if you want, because um, there's so much to talk about in, in, in these issues. But if you think about other countries that are doing this better, if you've just got a pool of people, right? And you take that pool of people and you pick out one little small section of it and you invest all your resources with those people and all the benefits with those people. And then separately, you have another pool and everybody there gets investment. Who do you think is going to be more competitive? So our national competition really is caught up with equity. And that's what we're starting to learn. Metros around the U.S. that are growing there and base these, pa these uh, practices. And really, equity equals empowerment. And so the model that we've got to get to is how we start to, because remember, we have a whole lot of people who never got economic opportunity. We're disempowered. Voices never heard, right? So then the solution to that has to be to how do we empower? How do we hear voice? How do we engage and drive resources in those directions? One way that we do that, and I was in a conversation just this morning about this, is that our models, particularly for social service, never depend on hearing from the customer in social service. Now, these people at Apple improve my iPhone every doggone day, right? <laughs> and yours too, because they are getting the feedback, we put in customer reviews and so on and so forth, right? A whole industry has sprung up around this, Yelp and you know, so on and so forth, right? But there is no mechanism that we are currently, particularly for funders in this community, where we actually hear from consumers, the clients, and let that drive our funding decision. And there's something that's fundamentally wrong about that. So there's no reason for nonprofit organizations to, to um, get in the um, cycle of innovation. Why? Because we never hear from the client. They don't have any accountability to those clients. So again, there are things that we can do to start to change these dynamics. So I was going to talk a little bit about the Community Foundation. Go to our website, check it out, and I'm happy to come back and talk about that. And so I'll end on this slide. Uh, so what can we do to engage structural racism? So remember the exercise that we did at the outset, right? And, and we said, some of the things that we were doing personally around structural racism, most of it was interpersonal. So I would propose to you that if you want to start working on structural racism, why don't we do it in a way that's attendant to the characteristics that we laid out earlier? So if structural racism is cumulative, then that means that we have an obligation to have historical awareness so we can understand how it has accumulated through history. That's an obligation for those that are folks that are saying, I want to be an anti-structural structural, uh, anti structural racism. That's what you can do is go do the homework, open the books, read about it, pick up a uh, color of law, there's a whole myriad of other books, get knowledgeable about it so that you can uh, be aware of the way that that is uh, played out through time. Adverse outcomes, not about intent, not about whether you're the person or not, all that stuff, right? Adverse outcomes for people of color require that then we exercise our privilege in the interest of the disaffected. So if you got a little something, exercise it in a way that's beneficial and be cognizant and mindful and intentional about doing so. The extent to which racism, structural racism is systemic, remember it's interacting, compounding, it's the systems that play with each other, require us then to collaborate with partners because individual people and even individual agencies can't solve a problem that's so big, right? So it's gonna require people to operate on multiple fronts. So what you wanna think about is who you can engage, partner with, collaborate with in the interest of reducing structural racism. And finally, that reprinting characteristic, that thing that it keeps coming back every time, I would just ask you to stay aware, be hyper vigilant, and then speak out. Somebody described it to me as being a skunk at the garden party. <laughs> when, you're, when you hear stuff, and particularly the structural stuff, when you get into your um, chosen profession and you're out there administering the public, please be vigilant. When you're in the meeting and someone says something that's obtuse, like, you know, you can figure out ways to do it tactfully, but like, please. Raise your finger and like point it out, right? When really, and just uh, really quick, one quick story that's important about this is that a lot of times, some of the things that we've seen, particularly kind of a combination of both the retention characteristic and the adverse outcomes, if you think of public housing in this country, public housing, we know it now as like this terrible thing, it's like, you know, all the housing complexes, the drugs, and so on and so forth. But public housing originally was really more of a liberal priority. 
right? It was how do we get people out of tenements and into decent, affordable housing? Good people came together and said, this is something that's really important that we really need, right? Because in these conversations, a lot of times because we haven't actually empowered the people that are um, living in circumstances to have voice, then all of our great intentions end up creating more of a morass than um, uh, we actually uh, originally anticipated, right? So stay aware and speak out, collaborate with partners, exercise your privilege in the interest of the disaffected, do the homework and be uh, historically aware and recognize that your personal choices, the things that you choose to do. So we talked about the kind of global well, now you, the things that you do, how you choose to visit these out uh, can either contribute or they can harm. They can either help us to dismantle structural racism or they can continue to bolster it. Thank you. I wouldn't say that there's anybody that is that is absolutely thriving, but there are certainly pockets and examples. So there's some interesting things that are happening in Kansas City. There are some interesting things that are happening in Baltimore. Um, and a lot of this work, I mean, I'm really privileged to work for a community foundation uh, where the enterprise that we're involved in is how we leverage um, uh, private capital to try to solve some of these problems. Um, and so we're seeing some meaningful gains. Another great example actually is in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, where um, a lot of the deploying of these equitable practices is a 10% decline in the poverty rate um, in Hartford, Connecticut, in a city that's not identical, but very, very similar to Rochester, New York. And, and a lot of practitioners there, we were at a, a conference actually not too long ago, and uh, so both heard anecdotally as well as some writings that they've been very intentional about trying to hear from client voice, hear from people that are on the ground. Yeah, yeah, so a couple of things. So number one, um, and this is, you know, kind of uh, an area that's very new <laughs> for the Community Foundation, because that hasn't historically been our uh, ballot, frankly. Um, but number one, I personally just make it a point to get out in the neighborhood and just knock on doors and talk to folks. So that's just number one. Number two, we're actually investing right now. Um, some uh, colleagues at RIT uh, put together um, a, a software package that basically is we're trying to aggregate widespread client opinion. And what we want to do is use that now to actually inform our grant making. So instead of you wrote a great theory of change and your application is wonderful and all that kind of stuff, what we actually want to ask is, do your clients like your service or not? Right? The thing that you're proposing, do people want it? Right? And if they don't, then, and we can actually even use the power of competition in that sense, particularly where, for example, the community schools conversation, that's where this came up this morning, uh, where you have multiple providers that want to enter into a school because they want access to those contracts, right? Uh, and that's just the facts. I mean, the, the folks want to sustain themselves and their, and their revenue streams, but they should have to compete for it. And the way that they should compete is based on the perspective of the clientele. So if you have the person that's rude and nasty to people and all that kind of stuff, maybe you shouldn't be in that school, right? Um, and so we're trying to kind of be a model, if you will, for how we can flip the systems. That's really what we see at the Community Foundation We've got, you know, we're the, the largest funder uh, in, in, uh, in upstate New York. We go back and forth, actually, with the Community Foundation of Buffalo, um, of, uh, of, uh, in terms of private philanthropy, at least. Um, but the model for Community Foundations has long been that we tend to be a risk capital. And then if we're willing to do it, then we can convince the government and other major funders who bring way more dollars to the table um, to perhaps dip their toe in the water. And so that's an, another piece that we want to try to do here is if we can link um, client voice and satisfaction to better service provision, if we can draw that linkage and make it clear, then, you know, people want to push against it. You know, I mean, at, at that point, it's, uh, you know, they can do that if they want, but if the data is clear, the data is clear. Oh. Actually, I get it too. I'm sorry, but we do have the class. 
So thanks again. Thank <laughs> you.